So anyway, so basically I'm uh, Anahit Tovanisyan and I originally am from Armenia and I did my master's and bachelor's degrees here in Yerevan State University, uh, the biophysics department. Uh, and then I went to Germany, the Tübingen, University of Tübingen and I had my PhD down there on the neural and the behavioral sciences. And after that, I uh, did uh, postdoc research in Stanford and the UC Santa Cruz area. Uh, uh, and uh, now I am a junk professor at the uh, California State University of Fresno. So basically, I am biophysicist who decided to become a neuroscientist, but physiological neuroscientist and behavioral neuroscientist. And when you do that, no matter how much uh, programming background you have, you end up doing that because you have to design your experiments, you have to design the stimulus that you are using, or you have to design as well. Oh, there is a spelling mistake. Sorry about that, but it doesn't really matter. Uh, so, uh, and uh, what is uh, very important that nowadays the programming skills are not anymore like specialty that you need, you can just, it's a really cool thing to, to, to do, it's just necessity. So nowadays world, you just need to use it wherever you go if you want to become uh, someone who is on the, on the um, top or on, in the forward of their own research or the area. So. Um, how many of you have been at my talk uh, like uh, yesterday? None of you, okay. So I'm going to cover some information about neuroinformatics so you kind of know and have an idea what it is about. And then I will talk about neural features and the profiles so that you can kind of understand which kind of data sets and the problems we are dealing with in the neuroscientific field. And then I will um, show which programs are used in general in the neuroscience on the different things that we are doing. And as well, I'll cover shortly about career options, like what you can do with the field that you are in to help the neuroscience field to move forward. So, okay, now I know that there is no neuroscientist in here so, which means that I need to dissect things a bit more. So, uh, in order to understand how nervous system works, we need to understand the basic unit of the nervous system. And to understand that, I just want you to imagine, like I have a micro microphone, yes, that's my input device. And then I have an amplifier, which amplifies my sound. And then I have a loud, uh, the speakers which basically give the output. And you can actually hear me loud and clear. And you are the ones who are receiving the information. So the nervous system and the basic unit of nervous system is a neuron, which is called a neural circuit. It's the circuit of the nervous system. And it does have an input, as we do have a microphone as an input. And it has senses, so basically, it's if uh, in my previous example, it was very simple. We had only one input. Neurons don't have one input. They can have hundreds or thousands of inputs depending on the type of the neuron, which means they are making connections to different neurons. And that actually makes the input much more complicated than just the linear one that I have presented with the microphone. Then we have a controller, which is the axon. And, or amplifier, which is the axon. Why we call it amplifier, the axon, because it speeds up the information speed. So if we just take it like a very basic thing, if we just have an axon without myelin, it will take like 100 times longer the information to get to the end, basically to the output part, which are basically the axonal terminals here which in, the, in here we have just a speaker, but here we have multiple terminals. So which means you, have, you are having multiple outputs. So in the sim simple example, I have one, one, one kind of example, but in the neurons you will have about 1,000 inputs and the outputs in total, in average. Just that you kind of get into the brain that's an example of the neuron that you see above, uh, which is the 3D reconstructed neuron. Um, kind of, sim so as you can see, the branches, how complicated they can be, and the networks that they can create, it's very, very huge. 
So this is colorful picture for you guys, but that actually means something. So that's part of the brain, and you can see the blue spots. The blue spots are the cells that are in the brain, and different colors are different cell types. And for example, you can see here, these lines are the dendrites, which make input, so they get receive the information. And then you can see, for example, this long line, that would be your axon, and the dendritic part, the output part, which make, make connections with the uh, different cell types. And this is just the one small piece of the brain. The brain is very complicated and very big and very messy. And in order to understand it, we need to dissect it. So I want you now to do some math. Just imagine that we have 86 billions of neurons in our brain. Okay, just imagine that number. And each neuron makes about, in average, 1,000 connections. Okay. On top of that, imagine that these neurons do interact additionally with the glia cells, which are about 22 billions. And on top of that, in order to understand the interactions and look at the inter inter interactions, we need to look into three different aspects of the neuron, morphology, function, and genetics. Just to bring a simple example, because I think none of you are, are really a biologist here, so the morphology is like when you look to the person, you are telling, okay, this person is tall, this person has long hair or short hair or something like that. So it's a morphological feature of the person. The functional one is like you have some physicists here or data scientists or business major people, so you have different functions in your life in the society, yes? And then you have genetics, which is like, we are Armenians or Georgians or, I don't know, Africans, doesn't really matter. So we are different by genetics as well from each other. So as you can see, not all Armenians are data scientists. Yes, they functionally are the same. Or no, not all Armenians are tall with short hair. So which means that as we are individuals and we differ from each other, the same is the neurons. As many neurons, as many individuals in the brain. So why I'm trying to do this, I just want to make point that we are dealing with tremendous amount of data sets and tremendous amount of interactions and connections. And when you just look at this, it's very messy, you don't know where to start. So that's why neuroscientists started with very, very simple steps. And where we are now, it's much more complicated and more. Yeah, it is basically very interdisciplinary compared when it was first established. So the neuroinformatics is actually a new uh, scientific field, which is very, very young. It's about 20 years old. So in order uh, to understand what is neuroinformatics, just imagine that it deals with uh, data analysis, uh, response prediction of the neurons, image processing, and modeling of the nervous system and neural processes and as well prosthesis development. Like you, you might as well know like there are people who are having like uh, hands or legs, they are don't having them. So you basically use the prosthesis to uh, kind of that they can actually walk. For example, I'm working with a visual system and now we are trying to create artificial eye that the people who don't have a visual system or they cannot see, they actually can see, you just implant them, but we don't. We are too, way too far from there. And I'll try to kind of, I'm trying to put this in, but that doesn't really work. Okay. Okay. Before, when people were making investigations about neuroscience, I mean, neuroscience is very, very old uh, research. If we just think about how people were looking at the brain and when they started to look at the brain, it goes back to 7,000 years. But as a neuroscience itself, it's not that uh, old scientific or research direction when people actually started to look into the brain, make images or do physiological recordings, about 100 years old. And in the beginning, they were looking at the morphology, just looking under the microscope and drawing the neurons and then they started to look into the physiology like reflexes and try to see how different like muscles do work and so on so that's when they started to find out that actually the electricity 
goes through our body and the neurons are interacting to the, through the electrical signals. And then the molecular uh, criteria came on, which is much younger than the other ones, but it moved much more faster because as soon as the molecular, like genetics, uh, I don't know, screening and so on, these techniques were established, it's now very easy. You can just send your sample and they give you the genetic profile of the cells. But nowadays it gets much more complicated because we are not only looking at the morphology or physiology or the genetics of the cells, as I've explained. If I looked at the person, I'm not only looking to the appearance or what he is doing or from which country or the nationality it is. So the same is with the neurons. In order to really fully understand how they are functioning, you need to have these all three components combined with each other. And uh, they all have their own difficulties. And uh, what I want you to keep in mind that all of them do share this. So the data accumulation might be a problematic thing, especially for the morphological and the physiological point of view. Data processing might be very difficult thing, especially when you deal with lots of data, um, like very big data sets. Data analysis, because it's a biological system, so we are dealing with the noises, and as well, you know, that we all are different, and if you try to do research, sometimes you do have biases, so you need to make sense out of that. Predictive analysis, when you are investigating lots of neurons, you want to predict, okay, I gave this information to the neuron and how it is processing the information and what is the output. Then you have a bunch of neurons and then you want to know what will be output there. So basically you are trying to find interaction and predict the responses of that. And of course the next thing is the modeling. When you have all of this done you need to have a reliable models like for example artificial eyes that actually they will work and they will function. So now we will uh, concentrate on the morphology. I just want you to show the setup, how it's done. So let's say if you, the animal model is the mouse, you remove the eye of the animal and then uh, take the retina out. In general, when I am talking about narrow system and the eye, people just think about the eyeball. But the retina is part of the brain and it is located on the back of the eye. And it is the one that goes, it's a part of the central, uh, central nervous system and uh, it has nothing to do with wearing glasses or something like that. And that's the information processing that reaches to your upper brain regions. So if you have a fluorescent microscope, which has different wavelengths, and you kind of apply different dyes to your cells, different cell types will be labeled with the different colors. And if you make a closer look, you can as well distinguish them from each other. And by looking at them, you can actually see the morphological differences and as well um, how they are interacting with each other, just morphologically, which is not really much of an information. And I will talk about it, why it is like that later. So I have a, a, a video here which I don't think it will play like this, but I should be able to open it through here. Is the sound higher here? We're heading into the center of a mouse's brain, into the hippocampus where memories are formed. Looking up, you can see neurons projecting to the surface of the brain. This is the work of Carl Dyseroff and his team at Stanford University. By making the entire brain transparent, they were able to image it using a light microscope. They call the new technique clarity. Existing techniques for studying the brain's wiring are often limited to looking at very small volumes of brain, or they don't allow you to label genes or chemicals of interest. The advantage of clarity is that you can label lots of molecules in whole brains. So how do you make a brain transparent? The thing that obscures the view is fat. Lipid layers surround each cell. 
To remove them without disrupting the cell structure, the team used a hydrogel to create a mesh to hold the rest of the components in place. Then they could clear away the fat. This is a mouse brain before and after. The brain is now transparent to light, but it's also permeable to molecules, which means scientists can add molecular markers to highlight specific features. In this one millimeter block of hippocampus, excitatory neurons are green, inhibitory neurons are red, and cells called astrocytes are blue. The technique works in human brains too. This is a chunk of the frontal lobe of a seven-year-old boy who had autism. It's possible to trace the path of a single nerve projection through a forest of other cells. When the team looked closely in one layer of the cortex, they noticed ladder-like patterns where neurons had connected back to themselves and to other neurons. Similar abnormal structures have been seen in animals with autism-like behaviours. Being able to analyse brain structures like this and match them up with molecular information could help neuroscientists uncover how changes to the brain underlie disease. So why I wanted to show you this video, first of all, you can see whole brain and you can see that the small dots that are there, for example, this, all the dots are the different cells. And this technique is very cool because you don't need to kind of cut sections of the brain in order to look different neurons and then reconstruct the slices to get whole information of one neuron because sometimes neurons can be really very long. Like sometimes they from uh, right hemisphere, they go to the left hemisphere, they are pretty long. But um, um, so here you don't need to. Um, the reason why you don't need to do it because the lipids itself, they are making the brain not transparent. They are basically making this white, non-transparent environment. And in order to go with a microscope and look into the cells, you have only a couple of micrometers uh, to get into the brain to, to be able actually to visualize them. And that makes very hard for us to have whole image because when you section, you, use, you lose some information along the way that then you have to kind of simulate to fill that information. So um, that's why um, this technique is really very interesting. And as you can see that the tracking, that the tracing of the neurons that has been shown in the video, it has been done um, with some algorithms which were developed. So kind of that the algorithm would realize, okay, or will recognize, okay, this is the single cell which goes from here to there. And that's something that we are dealing with, with the imaging, because to analyze and detect the neurons and track them properly, it's very hard thing to do. Okay, so now let's go back to my, the presentation. So I, I actually have uh, another video to show, but as we started pretty late, I'll just skip that one and I'll just go to the conclusion part. So for the imaging part, the neuroinformatics is going to deal with the timing because the um, image processing takes really long time. And in order to do it faster, the data has to become smaller because the images can be very huge, especially when you try to go through the layers and kind of try to scan through the brain, you are dealing with a very big amount, uh, big amount of the data size. The resolution is very important too, and the physics comes to help in this because uh, the microscopes nowadays that are created they can give you a resolution high enough that you can go and look into the processes, but the resolution cannot be high enough in order to see if these two neurons are actually attached to each other. And that's another problem because if the neurons do come close together, that doesn't mean that they are functionally connected to each other and they are actually speaking to each other. So for example, in this image, you can see that Okay, for example, here I do have the green dot, which is some protein on the uh, presynaptic part, and the 
red one is the postsynaptic part, like the input and output connections of different cells. And whenever you see color localization, it will look like yellowish or orangish. But doesn't necessarily mean that if these two proteins are stained, they are co-localized together and they are functional as well. Uh, another thing is that basically nowadays there have been developed two or three photon microscopes. So in uh, San, you see Santa Cruz, where I um, did my PhD, we were working with the engineers that they made a three photon microscope. And why you need the three photon microscope? Because in order to go deeper into the tissue, you have to travel much more longer distance. And with just one photon imaging, which is the confocal microscope, you cannot go deep enough. So that's why you are using different, like many more photons, which means that your resolution will get much more worse with this technique, but at least you can see some, some processes happening deeper there. So, um, and as well 3D reconstruction. Here is the electron microscopy image where you basically can spend months just to reconstruct one cell because you have to go through the slides and find the processes and track them in order to get these nice and colorful pictures. So, um, my, what, what I am trying to make the point here that the image processing is very heavy thing to do. And uh, as a neuroscientist, I did my old experimental analysis and it takes really long time for me and as well people like me to deal with the data analysis, just the technical component of that. So and, uh, here is just a neuron which is uh, showing, um, if I can go back. And just a short animation how the signal processing works. So you can see that it gets to the cell body from the axonal part, from the dendritic part, travels back, and then or travels the other way around because there is not only feed forward transport of the information, but you have as well feedback transport of the information. And actually in the neurons, that's exactly what is happening. It's an animation, but that's how the neurons are speaking with each other. Yeah, so another video that I want to show you, that's the, again, physiological recording, uh, which is done with the two photon microscope. Oops, sorry, that was not the one. I just showed you this. We're heading into the center of a massive... Oh, this one. So you can see these round yellow circles. I try to pay, make your attention to the green um, color that appears and goes back. The contrast is not that good because we have light on. But you can see as soon as there is the green, that means that the cell was responding to the stimulation that you were gi giving. And this is a living organism. So, and you can actually investigate the function by using an imaging. So kind of you are combining imaging, the morphology with the physiology. And if you see the green, that means this some proteins or signals going through the neuron, and that's what you are detecting. And there are some dyes that's called calcium imaging. And that's the dyes that you are using to kind of visualize the process. And the calcium imaging is cool, but again, we are dealing with the resolution pro problem, which has to be solved again. So um, now if we go to more, uh, uh, analytical part, how we are dealing with the analytical problems in the neuroscientific field. What I want you to pay attention, we have a neuron here. I think we are already familiar. Yes, that's the input, that's the amplifying part, and that's the output. And what you see here, these curves, are the responses, shapes of the responses that these cells do have in a different part of, along to their cell. So what you are doing, because as I told, you are detecting electrical signals from the neurons. You basically have your electrode, and whenever there is electrical signal, that's what you record, and they look like this. And depending where the recording is done, the shape is different. So by using this, you can actually get a physiological profile of the cell on the electrodes. And I'll just show you here. So that's the setup. This is the microelectrode array, which is basically you place your retina flat on the microelectrode array, so it's an array of electrodes, and you kind of record signal not from the single cell, but the population of the cells. 
Um, then you are projecting like the stimulations. If you do visual recordings, you try to put some like white screen or black screen on the retina and record the signals but with the electrodes from the cells. And that's what you are getting. That's going to be your physiological profile. So in the electrodes, you will see that the, each color is individual cell type. And you can see the activation area, how big is the area that they are covering. So there are these challenges in the physiological part. First of all, spike sorting. I'll talk about it a bit more in the next slides. The stimulus that you have to develop, especially at the visual field, the stimulation is very key and very important because depending different features that you want to investigate, you have to show different stimulus. For example, in our eye, we have some cells which are responding to the object which comes to, to us, but not when it goes uh, away from us. Or we have some cells which are responding when the object is coming from the left side and they are not responding to the object which comes from the right side. Uh, or there are some cells which are responding to the drifting stimulus, like when there is a, some like shade of the tree which is moving, but some cells don't respond to that. Which means that you really need to think and develop the stimulus correctly and properly to address what you kind of want to see inside of the retina. And the data processing, which is very important, and I'll talk about it, and as well population coding. So that's again the array that I was talking about. So you can see this gray part is the retina on top, of, on top of the array. And in the zoomed in part, that's basically the electrodes that we are having recordings then. And by recording, I mean you are recording electrical signal. Of course, you will have the noise because of the recording machines, they always have a noise. These sharp things are the responses that we are calling spike. So whenever the cell is responding to the stimulation, you see the spikes, the electric, like the electrical signal from the cells. Just to imagine how much data we are dealing with, um, I just want you to imagine we have here in this chamber only one millimeter in diameter tissue which record, is getting recorded out of 20,000 electrodes at the same time, which means that you are accumulating 80 gigabytes uh, raw data. And if you do recording for one hour, you have one terabyte of data, which is just imagine how big is the data information. So what I want you to keep in your mind that the electrodes that I have told doesn't really necessarily mean that one electrode means one cell. So the same electrode can record uh, from the, se the, the couple of electrodes can record from the same cell. So remember when I was showing the uh, neuron that in the different parts, the response look different. The same you see here, yes? So that's the electrodes and this is the cell. And you can see that from the different electrode perspectives, the response look different from the same neuron. And that's the raw data that you are dealing with. So in order to understand if the signals come from one cell or couple of cells, you have to do data processing, which we are calling spike sorting. And that's very uh, hard thing to do for us because we still don't know how to make it completely non-manual. Um, so what you see here is basically our data where you have the stimulation. You remember I told you if you switch on the light or switch off the light, the cells will respond. And usually in our system, especially visual system, the cells are responding to the change. So because as, as you can see in these parts, they were a change, so they, you can see the response. Then you are uh, applying high pass filter and you end up having the picture like this where here you have the baseline where the cell is kind of not active and in the middle is when the cell is responding and these lines means the responses. Uh, are you familiar with the uh, PC principal component analysis? So that's what we are using for the spike sorting and that's very simple why, way to do that. Uh, again, this is just a reminder that depending from which part of the neuron you record, the shape of the response looks different. 
And here, the, in, in general, what is the principal component analysis is basically linear analysis of the data. Let's say I have a data which has different parameters, like I have the amplitude of the response, and then I have the timing of the response, um, and, and different uh, kind of parameters. So what it does, it basically looks at the amplitude of two different units and tries to see if they are separate or not. So you can see that the blue one is most of the time the noise because it's closer to the zero, but you have this cloud where you have mixed colors and you don't know if it is from different cells or from one single cell. But if you apply the shape of the response, you can see that you can separate the responses of the neurons. So this is the cold spike sorting, and that's very hard thing to do because you are dealing with the different parameters of the data. There are some algorithms that are developed to kind of have the platform to do that, but it's still done completely manually. Like uh, there are some solutions that uh, people did come up, like um, I don't want to talk about this. Yeah. So there are some uh, like deep learning methods that people are using. For example, the shape, yes, of the response that I was showing. If you look at the timing of the spikes, you can tell, okay, shapes look different, but they appeared exactly the same time and they are around the same electrode. So it has to become from the same cell. So that comes from one cell. And that basically the deep, deep learning algorithms, which kind of makes easier or shortens the time of the spike sorting manual component of it, but you still need to go and do the data checks. Uh, another thing is basically unsupervised quality uh, matrix modeling that uh, is applied on top of the principal component anal analysis. We are still having a problem with the accuracy and reliability of the softwares and data analysis platforms. And uh, this is something that it's very hot currently in an aeroscientific field. And if you are interested, you can actually look at that and try to get involved in it. Another thing is the pro um, uh, data processing which is basically data sign, accumulation speed, uh, correlation between different data, set, data sets, and the designing accurate and reliable algorithms. So here what we have, I tried to kind of bring your attention to the very simple artificial neural system. So um, the computational models will perform tasks because we do have lots of data sets where we have an input, we have the stimulus shown to the cells, and then the cells are basically sh giving you some output. And based on that, you can kind of combine different cells together computationally and get the model response of the network, which is, uh, it's not completely true because if you look in this picture, you can see that's the actual neuron and this is the model neuron, yes? The actual neuron do have much more many dendrites or inputs than we do have with the artificial neurons because we have to simplify, yes? And as well, there is lots of intermediate interactions for the, uh, for the real neurons that we cannot mimic in the artificial cells. So that's why whenever you are making a models or a prosthesis, they cannot be fully the same as your um, as real system. And why we do have such a big problem with the visual system, because we have so many intermediate interactions that we still don't know how to dissect, that when you are trying to make very simple eye, it's really not functioning. Um, so another thing is basically the speed of the information. For the different neurons, the, they have different speed of the information that travels through them. But for the artificial neuron, it's always the same. You just have fixed parameter for that, which means that information travels at the same time everywhere, so you don't have a bias in your data. Then the power consumption is important as well because our uh, artificial neurons are dealing with the comp computer power and we still don't have that powerful computers which will deal with many multiple connections, yes? Compared to our brain which deals with the, with the food that we are eating and 20% of the energy that actually we take in, it goes to the brain. So the brain uses lots of tremendous amount of energy which we cannot provide with our computers at least now. 
and as well the learning. Another thing is very important because the neurons do change their interactions and connections over time. With our model system, we cannot do that because we cannot predict how the changes can be, at least not for now. And uh, that's why um, there are lots of mistakes with the uh, uh, artificial neural networks. So the tell challenges will be brain development, as I told, because the artificial neurons never get developed. They are just having certain parameters that you set, which you can play around, but you cannot change them. Uh, then brain can easily adapt to very different environmental changes. The artificial neurons, they, they cannot be, and brain is much more dynamic, and artificial neurons are not. In order to deal with this problem, we need to accumulate much more data than we have now, which means that you have to apply lots of different stimulus, hundreds of tons of the data with the same stimulus, apply the machine learning techniques, and try to improve the prediction of the neural responses. And of course, you have to still work to develop new neural uh, algorithms and analyzes. And as well, there is tons of new stuff coming each year. So in order to kind of know what is happening, and someone has done it already, and to work with them, you need to always communicate, go to the conferences, be in the focus group of workshops in order that, because nowadays the research community comes together. And in order to make something done faster, you just need to work together. So I'm not going to talk about genetics uh, because I think I... So here are the programs that are used. So uh, for the morphological analysis, okay, I'll just do this. We are using Fiji, which is a very simple platform. And usually the platforms that are existing there, you can go and change. You can add some macros in it. You can do some modifications depending on your purpose because they are doing very simple analysis and they are never perfect for your purpose of the research. The next is the Mathematica that is used, but the Mathematica is very, um, data, it, it basically keeps all the data there. So it gets very heavy when you are dealing with many images. So it's much harder to deal with the speed of the analysis. Um, the next thing is the... You can uh, do it till kind of 5.30, no problem. Oh, okay. okay. I think. But then you come to the big hole for closing soon. Okay. Yeah, so the, um, the MATLAB, which is my favorite kind of uh, programming language for the near imaging analysis or the physiology analysis, because it is kind of making the data smaller a bit than Mathematica would do. So the processes are much faster and as well it deals with the functions, inbuilt functions. So in order you just write whole big code, you just are using functions that are already written. So it kind of makes the size of the uh, programming smaller. And of course you have uh, as well the companies which are making the microscopes and they are providing or trying to provide imaging profiles just to do some simple modifications which is still not enough to get your research done <laughs> the way that you want to do. Uh, so the, in the physiological field, uh, so I mentioned MATLAB, Mathematica, Igor Pro is used as well, and you can write lots of macros in it. It's less structured and it's lot very messy, but I did use that. Now uh, lots of labs do use the Python, the JavaScript as well, if you are having the data scientists involved into the um, research, neuroscientific research, they prefer to that, that better than the other programming languages, but I think now we are preferring more using the Python than MATLAB uh, because again of the speed of the uh, programming and uh, dealing with the data sets. So, and I have here a list of the things that you can do if you are data scientists in the neuroscientific field. So you can be a computational neuroscientist, which is basically using mathematics and the computers to construct models uh, of the brain. You can be a neuroinformatician, which will combine the informatics and the neuroscience to deal with the neural information processing by uh, creating artificial neural networks. Or you can be a data scientist and develop the accurate and reliable data analysis like a, uh, uh, 
programs or platforms. App developers can be as well very useful in the neuroscientific field. For example, the image processing. Yes, you can develop an app which deals with certain type of part of analysis and then you can sell it and if it is done, it is doing really good job. I believe me, lots of neuroscientists will be happy to have it because as I told, I am spending that time and I can save that time and do more research than just troubleshooting with the data analysis. The bioinformaticians are as well involved in this and by involving in this, uh, I can just bring my example. So I was working with um, uh, when I was in, doing my PhD, one of the, our, our group project was on the um, retina degeneration when the light sensitive cells are dying off. So basically you are left with the cells which don't see. And how you can deal with that, one of the things is to put them light sensitive channels. And you can actually separate them from let's say the green algae which they do have that kind of light sensitive cells, but they are not as fast as our light sensitive cells of the retina are, so you need to modify them. And the bioinformaticians basically, they just design or change some components of that channels and provide them, but you can never get the perfect one because there can be some channels with activate faster, but disactivate slower and the other way around, or the channels would activate with the yellow light or with the green light, but you need to have very much more bigger spectrum of the, um, of the light in order to fully recover the vision. So that's how bioinformaticians are involved in a neuroscientific field if we just exclude the gen genetical part. And then optical physics, which is very important too, especially nowadays, people don't want to go and do slices and look into the brain. They just want to image them. And which means if you image, you get at the same time the functional information and you get at the same time as well morphological information. So you don't need to go and dissect the brain, do the physiological recordings and then dissect the brain and then align this information because that all takes lots of time. Um, and if you are interested, I can give you some of contact information to see what other people have done and what, are, what we are standing at that point. Uh, animation, animators as well can be involved in the um, neuroscience by creating nice animations for the educational purposes. Like if you have some certain function that you have discovered, you can give them and then they can develop nice animation so you can show it. And of course, engineers which can develop the neural prosthesis. And um, one thing that I want to mention in order to be a um, neuroinformatician or someone who deals with the neural system, you don't need to have very big background in the neurons and understand how it works. Because when you go, they give you a task, you get to know the articles and what is needed, and then you just do your job. That's basically it. I think that's what I was going to say. So just to conclude, it looks a bit messy, but I try to put everything here. So the neuroscience needs help to develop new technologies. It needs help to find better ways to deal with large data sets and their analysis. So as ne 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 neurons are, uh, it, it's basically multidisciplinary uh, system than neuroscience. So it kind of combines everything that you can imagine. Everyone can feel comfortable in this field, even psychologists or philosophers. I have very good neuroscientific fr neuroscience friends who are doing like philosophers who do neuroscience and psychologists who do neuroscience. They are just approaching differently uh, to that. Uh, yeah, then uh, and, uh, areas of interest can include computational visual algorithm development, motor learning, generalization pattern recognition and predictive analysis, neural imaging, image processes, neural network analysis, neural modeling, uh, and of course artificial uh, intelligence. If you use, um, it will really, really help to predictive uh, analysis and the clinical trials because we are now dealing with lots of data and if you know how normal brain works, it would be much easier and faster to detect the diseased uh, brain and find, try to find the solutions. Yeah, that would conclude my talk. If you have questions, I'll be happy to answer them. If you don't have questions, I'm scared because that means I didn't explain clearly. Uh, can I uh, say the Armenian? 
Uh, yeah, yeah. So when I speak about my research or my field, I am using English because that's how it's easier for me. Yeah. Words that I Yes, Intermediate network Nerkan. I think in Dukaras inch for banner popohes input you out put image. By so in act sans atalantum, the unes intermediate revi hazard its avel bejit. They are you at kind of control ara. Garasanes yet information unes by telemank chunen get can. I think inch for information. Okay, I'll just say. Okay, we have some information about how visual networks work, but the thing is that there are so many different cell types and they are functioning so many different ways. We still don't know how they work. With the artificial neurons, you can kind of give the task if you know already how it works, yes? But if you don't know clearly, lots of things are still in there that we don't know how they work. You cannot really mimic the input and output um, like a correctly. That's why, that's what I'm trying to say, in the visual system we don't have yet prosthesis. We do have some examples, but they are not really very well functional. But for example, for cochlea implants, we do have, because the system is much easier, so simulations are much easier, and what you are uh, mentioning, you can do that. Of course, it's not just linear. You can add nonlinear components and try to kind of simulate and make the learning um, how it's called, kind of artificial neurons kind of can learn, but it's different than what you will get from the real neurons. Did I make my point? Hi, uh, you can get very simple system, but it's never going to be as good as the real nervous system is. Because as you are mentioning, yes, that's true. We have much more many neurons in the newborn brain than we are ending up having into the adulthood. And they are actually surviving because they are sending signals and making connections. So if the cell doesn't make a connection, it will just die off. But the thing is that, okay, you have created the connections. There are lots of feedbacks that you cannot really dissect. And I'll bring one example from my PhD uh, dissertation that I had. So I was working at the glias, uh, at the ganglion cells, the output of the visual system. Uh, and in the model, which is the multiple sclerosis model. So basically I was looking into the mice that they are born with non-myelination and they never get myelinated. Ideally the ganglion cells that you are thinking, they are, they should uh, just be affected and the output should be affected, but not input because input is not dealing with the ganglion cells. But, but what happened, I found out that there is still some feedback mechanisms that we still don't know how they work, which are affecting the neurons in the inner retina. Of course, you will have your model system which works, but if your research didn't show things that are there existing, and there are lots of variables that we haven't really discovered yet, your model can never be perfect. You cannot ever mimic, or in one, I don't think that you can ever get 100%, but with the, especially with the retina research, we still have a lot to do. I understand. Uh, mm -hmm. I think that this is uh, only a computational problem mm -hmm. because uh, the neurons are uh, many and uh, to 
computated uh, system uh, in real world, it's very difficult. Only problem. That's what I'm telling. We are dealing with the computational problem. That's why we need data scientists to help us to develop good. Like if you are, if you don't know how to do the simulations, you can tell. Of course, it's possible. But in order, when you are getting the data and you have to play around and you need to develop models, you end up seeing so many different things that make no sense. So you have some piece of the puzzle that they don't come together, and that's what is the problem. That's why I try to make a problem. Uh, my point that in the narrow scientific field, we still need to do lots of data science in order to develop correct or reliable algorithms or to develop reliable models. Okay. Uh, because, uh, you mentioned that uh, for spike detection, you use both uh, deep learning methods and unsupervised learning uh, methods. Uh, can you please name some of those? Uh, because we have similar data science problems. We're not neuroscientists, mm -hmm. we just data scientists, but it's interesting. Yeah, so I personally, have dealt on the principle with the, I have used only principal component analysis. Uh, the deep learning, I didn't really use. I know this is very new, like, it's like two years ago that it came up, and I am not really actively doing research now, so I didn't use them. But I know that now they are trying to kind of add deep learning because, uh, as I told you, so there are some parameters in the data that you can kind of use to predict okay, there are these things, so this should not like cancel out, so it make it easier of the sorting of the data, like dividing the cells from each other. That's so why it is very important to divide cells correctly, because if you want to look into the features and kind of find out what they are doing, you need really clearly to separate data. And that's the key before even you start looking into the data. And uh, if you are interested, I can send you some papers which are showing the different methods, how to deal. And I am usually telling if you are a data scientist, it doesn't really matter from where the data comes. You just get the data and you just need to, the problems are pretty, they are sometimes almost the same <laughs> in all the fields. And yeah, we are, I can, I can share that with you. I, mean, I would be grateful okay. for the papers. Yeah, I think last year they, uh, published even data, yet another spike sorting algorithm. So we are really having a very hard time with that. Because you still have to go and check and add and cancel and move some points here, move some point that there to just get a clear you know, separation of the data sets. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you think about strong technical intelligence uh, when it will be possible with uh, current technology? Uh, okay, we have two variables here. We have the computational component and we have an experimental component. Experimental researchers, they need to catch up by doing uh, lots of amount of the data accumulation. Yes, they need to do lots of experiments with the different stimulus and kind of think what uh, our brain would see and just develop them. And the stimulus development is another whole big story, how to make them correctly done, because you have to align them correctly, you have to, timing should be correct. That's well the uh, technology that you use to present, like the hertz, the frequency of the stimulus that you are sure. So there are lots of things as well there to deal. So you need to accumulate lots of data with the dots of variables, and the data scientists need to find out better way of the separating data sets from each other and make it the manual component as small as possible that we actually get to the point the data is there we have kind of know what is the input what is the output and how we can put them together and have a prediction of the response so both things both parts are still behind <laughs> And, but I think we will catch up faster because nowadays the data scientists get involved really into the research. Before, like when I was doing PhD, we were doing all of ourselves. But nowadays the bigger labs, they are actually hiring data scientists to do the data analysis part so that the experimental scientist doesn't really spend months finding out how to deal with this, with this or that data analyzing problems. So if we work all together, it will be much faster <laughs> to answer to your question. Any other questions? No? no? Okay. Uh, can you 
to see many paper that uh, the deep learning models require uh, this problem or problem with narrow. Deep learning is used for the spike sorting. So, uh, as I have shown you, yes, you have a data, you have an electrode. An electrode is detecting signal not from one neuron, but it can detect signal from 10 neurons. Okay? And at the same time, the single neuron can be detected by 10 or 20 different electrodes, depending how small they are and how close they are to each other. So, what is the spike sorting? The deep learning is kind of uh, predict, um, using like learning, you are looking like you are designing the program which looks through your data sets and tries to find out, okay, there is a timing component, so I can use it. If it appears exactly the same time, that has to come from the same neuron, although I have detected from 10 different uh, electrodes. It's kind of, it's not about finding out how, what neurons, how neurons are responding, it's about accumulating data and separating each single cell from each other. Then afterwards, you can, of course, look to different parameters and deal with the coding of the information. But the spike sorting itself is just the very beginning step of dealing with the raw data and kind of sorting it out and knowing, okay, these are separate cells, now I can go and look at them. Okay. No more questions? Okay, <laughs> I guess that would be all. Thank you.